It's time now for County Wide, a special presentation of Yavapai Broadcasting News. Join Paul David and Brad Miller as they talk with our community's leaders, newsmakers, and people in the know. You'll hear about the hot topics that affect all our lives here in Yavapai County. And now, here's today's County Wide. Welcome to County Wide. I'm Paul David. Great to have you in the studio today. We're going to talk about defensible space on this April 1st, 2014. Wildfire season has been upon us, actually, I think, for about a month and a half now. Uh, Central Yavapai Fire District Fire Marshal Rick Chase in the studio today. You'll recognize his voice. Now you get to see his face, just like mine. And Battalion Chief Gary Cordes is in the studio today. Welcome, guys. Well, thank, thank you. you. Good to, to see you. There. Nice to have you back, Rick. Yes, thank you. This is Gary's first time. <laughs> we'll go gentle on you. All right. We want to talk defensible space. And I've been thinking about this, and I think I talked to you, Rick, maybe a month ago about this just that we're seeing grass fires pop up. I know you guys had one between Prescott and Prescott Valley, at least one that I know of that I'm thinking about. Um, I think just about every jurisdiction around Yavapai County and in Coconino County has been dealing with fires. And then we had the two fires this weekend on the Coconino National Forest. There's a, what, a six acre one secret fire in the Secret Mountain Wilderness, mm -hmm. which is about 10 miles northwest of uh, Sedona. And then they had one up on Mount Eldon, the area that burnt really bad back in the 70s and is still just, you know, moonscaped up there. Mm -hmm. So we've got wildfires going on. Is that right? It is, yes. Paul. Ab absolutely. In fact, even throughout the winter, you know, a couple days after a snowstorm, we've had some, you know, a couple acre fire moving in the grasses. Mm -hmm. Those fine fuels are just very dry and they never had a chance to really uh, moisten up this winter just with the lack of moisture. There there, have been small fires, but... I mean, right, right now, it's almost like, okay, spring starts, mm. 11 o'clock in the morning, it's almost like a switch goes on and the winds start to howl. Yep. That's pretty typical. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. So what do we do to get people to be just extra careful with these fires? Well, we try to get the word out and doing like what we're doing right now is the, a great way. We just try to get the education out there on the radio and the newspapers, um, you know, websites. There's ways that people can look at, you know, follow what the weather patterns are doing. The windy days. One of the things we recommend is getting a burn permit. They're, they're no cost. They could go right online to our centralyavapifire.org website. Mm -hmm. Prescott Fire also has, we, we have a joint burn permits. So folks can get in there, put in their information, and it will say on the website if there is burning that day or not. And so, you know, they can click right under there, and, and if it's no burning allowed because of windy conditions, red flag or high fire danger, you know, they can see that and obviously not burn. Is this the time of year to start working on defensible space? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What kind of things am I looking to do that I should be doing around my property? Let's let's get right into the defensible space part because that's really why I wanted you to come down, Rick and Gary, yeah. to talk about defensible space. We've been pushing it, I don't know, maybe the last five years or so, it became a really big deal, yeah. defensible space. We had some pretty big wildfires go on and we've seen homes destroyed and things like that. And so defensible space is always something we seem to hit in the spring. In the fall, it's all about fireplaces, wood stoves and things of that nature. Right. Now we're in the spring. We've got the strong winds. Uh, Gary, you were talking about, um, I wanted to ask you also, the conditions right now over on the Central Yavapai Fire District. How are the, the conditions outside? We had a pretty heavy monsoon, mm -hmm. so we have a lot, lot of light fuels that, that grew from that grasses and small weeds or brush, and, and uh, a lot of that is retained in the area. So we have a lot of light fuels that are dry. You talk about the windy conditions that we get, basically deal with in Prescott Valley daily. Um, that continues to dry it out. Early in the morning, you might r get some recovery with the dew or the, the, the RH, the relative humidity, but we're not seeing those that, that occurring as often, and within a couple hours of the sun being on it, it's, it's ready to burn. Yeah. Add a little bit of, of uh, wind to that. We can get some pretty good wind-driven light fuel fires out there right now, and that's kind of what we're seeing with, with the small stuff starting now. Mm -hmm. We've had red flag warnings. We've got one today. Yeah. Right. yeah, we had one yesterday as well. And What does that mean? Let's that, let everybody know exactly what a red flag warning means. That means absolutely no burning. No burning allowed at all. Because that's, <clears throat> those are the conditions that will spread a fire and it will turn into a big wildfire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and basically it's, it's uh, the red flag conditions are based off of the re relative low uh, humidities. Mm -hmm. uh, the wind speed, which is 20 miles, from, uh, kind of a bit more of uh, consistent wind speeds of, of uh, 20 miles an hour or more, mm -hmm. and just the, the uh, overall conditions in the area. Yeah. Now, I know Sedona Fire, they just sent out a thing last week saying that they were going to issue burn permits, free burn permits, but if the winds were over 10 miles an hour during the day, 
no burning would be allowed. Is it similar in all jurisdictions as far as fires go with, with burn permits? Is that about right? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure what all the jurisdictions do, but I think we all mirror each other pretty close throughout mm -hmm. the county. You know, we all work real well with the Yavapai County Emergency Management also, and, and so we all try to be on the same page with when we're gonna go into our stage one burn restrictions, our stage two restrictions, which if folks, you know, you can again read the papers, um, you know, on the internet, listen to the media, and we'll get the word out when we're gonna be going towards these restrictions. Do you think those are coming soon? Are you guys prepping for a wildfire season? You know, I think it's gonna come earlier this year. It seems to me like the last few years that they come a little bit earlier. It's just our winters have been drier consistently, so until we really get a really good, moist winter, I believe that these are just gonna keep happening earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by using the website uh, for to, to work the burn permit system is you have to log on every morning to, to initiate your burn, and it'll tell you right then whether burning's gonna be allowed that day or not. Yeah. Okay. And so we try to, you know, we understand people need to get rid of some of the debris in the yard, and, and burning is a good way to do it under under the permitted circumstances yeah. and, and restrictions. However, um, it, it goes day to day, so you, what you're able to get a permit yesterday and burn yesterday, and maybe you didn't finish what you're trying to accomplish, um, it may be shut down today, so you have to log in and out uh, daily on that, and it keeps you up to date as to what's being allowed. Okay, so you guys do the the website where you just log in yes. and take a look. Okay, I know yes. so far you got to call first and yeah. and check. So it depends on which which district you're in or, yes. or fire department. Okay, um, let's take a quick break. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, let's like go around the house and, and kind of outside what it is we need to deal with to, to make sure we have Absolutely. defensible space, okay? Rick Chase with Century Amplify Fire District in studio today, along with uh, Gary Cordes. I'm Paul David. This is Countywide. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. Thanks for calling the GED Pep Talk Center. Jerry Schiller speaking. Your level seven in your face pep talk. I can keep pushing. Believe me, I'm good at it. But at some point, you're going to need to start pushing yourself. See, once you've got your GED diploma, you, you'll feel so good about yourself. You tell them. You can't change your past, but you can definitely change the future. That makes me so happy, I'm ready to bust out of dance. Mr. Trejo, can I transfer this guy to you? My gentle technique isn't really working. You need something a little more... Persuasive? Yes! You listen, and you listen good. Hey, where's my sandwich? Terry? Terry! Take it from me to King DMC. It's a real cool thing to get your GED. Get that diploma! Now hold on and we'll find you free GED classes. Capiche? Whatever motivation you need, we've got a pep talk for you. Get your GED pep talk and find free classes at yourged.org. I'm one on Monkey Guy. The chance of being involved in a robbery is 1 in 757. The chances of being struck by lightning... 1 in 750,000. Please fasten your seatbelts for unexpected turbulence. The chances of being a victim in an airline crash? 1 in 29 million. Hey, could I get some peanuts? The chances of being involved in a car crash are far greater than lightning strikes and plane crashes. And if you are texting while driving, your risk of crash increases 23 times. Now, I may be an unlucky guy, but I don't have to be part of that statistic, and neither do you. Drive responsibly. Welcome back to Countywide. We are talking defensible space on today's program. We want everybody to get their homes prepared for wildfire season. We do believe that it's going to be a dandy this year. It was a hell of a fire season last year, but this year we haven't even had a winter, really. Yeah. Uh, it was extremely dry, extremely warm, uh, no snow, no rain, so we're there. It's, it's happening. Let's go into defensible space. Um, Firewise.org is a great website to go to. I went to it this morning and looked at it, and it's got all kinds of great information as to how you can make your property wildfire, maybe not safe, but wildfire, what's the word I'm looking for? Ready. Ready, wildfire <laughs> yeah. ready, yeah, that's very good. So let's talk a little defensible space, okay? I got my house, I've got my trees, my bushes, and stuff like that. What is it that I need to be looking for out there to make sure I'm prepared? Sure, Paul, one of the things, you know, living in the urban interface, such as a lot of people do, it's, it's beautiful up there, it's great, you're in the pines, or whatnot and 
yeah, you've got to look around your property and say, okay, what can I remove? What fire needs is basically a continuous fuel. It needs a path. It needs a way to get somewhere. So if people look around their homes and their properties where they live and, you know, figure out which bushes to remove without removing everything because, you know, having nothing but dirt wouldn't be uh, very pretty out there, but they can remove certain bushes. You know, we recommend removing uh, the dead and, dead and down trees or dead trees that are standing, uh, a lot of the dead uh, bushes as well, and still keeping it out there so you have the beauty, but yet you don't have that continuous path for fire to travel. Uh, a lot of people have, you know, a lot of dry grasses, you know, cut those grasses down. Blades of grass that are a couple inches high will put a flame length out, you know, a foot or two high, whereas, you know, your grasses that are two and three feet, they'll put, you know, flame lengths that are five, six foot. And, uh, of course, as you mentioned earlier with the winds, you know, you get any kind of flame length with embers and the winds come through and that fire is going to spread. So, you know, we recommend, you know, m removing some bushes, um, trimming your trees up about six foot off the ground. So mm -hmm. if a ground fire did move through there, it okay. wouldn't have a, a path to go up to the tree, up into the crowns, and a lot of fires move in the crowns of trees also. Um, you know, raking up dry uh, pine needles and leaves on the ground, cleaning gutters, getting the pine, pine needles out of gutters, removing wood piles away from homes. You know, I've seen a lot of homes where they'll have this humongous wood, wood pile right next to it, so in the wintertime you don't have to travel far to get, you know, your firewood. But as summer comes, we need to remove those piles away from the home. That's a good point. Yeah, it's, it's just a great idea. So basically people look around and figure out uh, on their property what can they remove so if a fire did move, you know, from a different direction, it couldn't continuously move to their homes. Mm -hmm. um, we recommend about 30 to 50 feet around a person's home, you know, to, to clean up. If folks live on a hill, because fire does travel quicker up a hill, uh, we recommend about 100 feet um, around, you know, around their homes, especially on the downhill slope. Why the extra distance on a, up, on a house on a hill? Just because fire does move um, quicker uphill, the heat, as heat and smoke rise, it just helps preheat everything that goes okay. up the hill from there. It's just reaching out. It's just that. reaching okay. out, exactly. Okay. So if you remove that, that fire will still burn, it will still creep uphill, but uh -huh. if it doesn't have something to light, it won't be able to move real quickly to the home. So. And typically it, it burns more intense uphill, so you have longer flame lengths. So. Mm -hmm. It's so, reaching out farther. Right. Yeah. Okay. We 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 were running a we're running a commercial action on the channel right now that I thought was really well done. It's a tree, a big tree. There's a house next to it, and it shows this ember blowing through the air, and it touches the tree, and then it touch, talks about remove overhanging limbs from your roof, yes. and then that ember drops down into the rain gutter, remove pine needles from the rain gutter, and then it blows off of there, and it touches the wood pile that you uh -huh. mentioned down below, yeah. and then it lands finally on the. Uh, kind of like a just a, a stone walkway mm -hmm. and the ember goes out and and that's kind of the goal that we're looking for here yeah. right what we what we deal with a bunch of scientific different names is in the fire service but we have what's called the pig or the probability of ignition oh, okay. and and it's based on on again relative humidity the temperature of the day um, the fuel moistures and all of that so a lot of these fires aren't just direct flame impingement it actually leapfrogs ahead of itself by spotting out ahead and sometimes mm -hmm. we're seeing uh, spot fires typically in this area are between a quarter and upward to a half a mile ahead wow, of time. Wow, that's something. Yes. So it's you have this shower, or this raining of all these embers from the the fire as it's as it's trying to leap itself out of, ahead, and so you have these receptive fuel beds, and that's some of what we're talking about is the light fuels, piles of lumber, any of that kind of stuff um, can mm -hmm. can get that ignition. And we've been seeing in, in over the probably the last ten years the probability of ignition in the, in the high 90 percentile to 100 percentile, which oh, wow. means almost every ember is going to start something, and it just depends on how big that receptive bed is as to how, how far or aggressive that will spread. So we see it not only in, you know, it's going to land throughout the yard, you're going to see embers, and a lot of people will see those uh, charred embers out maybe even a mile or farther ahead where the column has carried them, but they've, they've cooled down and they're seeing those land out in the yards. And, and uh, so it, it's really uh, testimonial to how far that stuff can actually reach. And so it's, it, there's all kinds of receptive fuel beds, whether it's a boat in the yard, um, anything that, that basically mm -hmm. that stuff can rain into. Um, you just want to make sure all that stuff's clean and secured. And um, we look at ornamentals. We touched on that a little earlier when we were talking uh, uh, ornamental plants uh, can be just as dangerous as something from the out of, from outside the wildland. We plant, these, we plant these junipers around the house, 
but they're drying out. Even if you're watering them, they're still they're still in the environmental conditions where they're drying out. And ember lands into that, and they have enough sap or uh, fuel within them that they can torch out. They're typically under an eave or right up against an eave in a planter, and that'll that'll create heat right up there and spread right into the house relatively fast. We see uh, fires creeping along the creosote uh, timbers the railroad ties and stuff people are using for landscaping. If you're using any of that wood type landscaping against the house, it's still a receptive fuel bed. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly enough, it doesn't have to be in a small small broke down component to, to actually catch fire and, and lead. It, it'll be a more slower uh, moving yeah. uh, smoldering fire, but that's what we see down the road. Um, as we come back to subdivisions, that's typically what's what's Take, carrying the fire into the wards of structures. Interesting, okay. Now, if, if I've got questions, if I go out in my property and I don't know where to begin, if I were to call you guys or my local fire department, will you come out and take a look at it and say, okay, you should probably, with a checklist, and say, yeah, you should probably take care of this and this and... Absolutely, Paul. In fact, if somebody does live in the Central Yavapai Fire District's boundaries, we have a program where we'll go out and we'll give somebody a property assessment. What we'll do is we'll walk around with them and we'll absolutely do that. We'll give them recommendations on what to remove, what to trim up, just to give them that defensible space that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And I believe Prescott Fire has the same thing as well. And then they have a chipper crew that can come out and help folks that can uh, chip up some of their material that they have trimmed down as well. So I would say if I'm an elderly person, maybe alone, and I have, don't have the energy or the power to be able to do something like that, how do I, how do I go about getting help with that? Is, is that something you guys would help with? or? Probably not, huh? You know, we don't have crews that, that yeah. will go out and do that, but again, we can walk with the folks and help uh, give them recommendations and tips on what to remove. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, sometimes, you know, people will have, there's a lot of landscapers out there that actually have become, um, if I want to use the term firewise landscaping, where they're familiar with what to remove and to help people out. Oh, really? And we okay. actually have a list of contractors that when we give these <clears throat> property assessments, mm -hmm. we'll give these to the folks and they can choose a, you know, a contractor of their choice. But uh, yeah, these folks will go out and they'll help prepare these people's property for them. Um, you know, talking about the firewise, a lot of the communities now are becoming a firewise community. And that's where you get a certain number of homes within that community that have provided a, defense, a defensible space on their properties. Um, this not only helps out the whole community, but if they were to have a fire on their property, it can prevent that fire from moving into the forest and, and you know, moving on from there. Uh, another thing, and kind of touch on what Gary was talking about with the ornamental plants, there are a lot of plants out there that are considered a firewise plant. The local nurseries and again, the landscape contractors, a lot of them are aware and, and know of what kind of plants these are. They have a higher uh, moisture content, and so they won't burn if an ember was to land on them. Oh, really? Something like the, you know, some of the scrub oaks, the manzanitas, and these kinds of plants that burn a lot hotter and quicker. There's plants that won't burn quite like that, so people can still have the beauty of, you know, the greenery and the vegetation on the property, but in a safer manner. Okay. All right. Yeah. Why don't we take our second break? When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about evacuation because we definitely want to hit that as well. Just in case something does come to your house, there's a fire out there and you have to be evacuated. We should, we should probably hit on that this morning as well Absolutely. as defensible space. Okay, we're going to take a quick two-minute break. County Y will be back in just a couple minutes. A single ember from a wildfire can travel over a mile. That ember can ignite and destroy your home or community. You can't control where that ember will land. Only what happens before it does. Visit fireadapted.org to learn how you can help protect your community from wildfires. Full life, measured in seats, starts with the right ones early on. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Learn how to prevent deaths and injuries by using the right car seat for your child's age and size. Know what? What? Since I got adopted, I've learned a lot about these humans. Uh, I know. I mean, check out these two. It's Flirt City over here. Yeah, I noticed that. It looks like my human is definitely into your human. Oh, look! I think she's getting his number. Nice. Your human's got some sweet moves. Takes after his dog. <laughs> oh, look, they're doing that thing where they put their arms around each other. She kicked up a leg. It's like in the movies. That's awesome. Looks like we're going to be hanging out a little bit more. Look at me. Hey. Raymond, look at Mommy. 
Maybe the light hurts his eyes. Maybe she's just not hungry. Maybe he can't hear us. Ooh. Maybe we're not stimulating him enough. Maybe it's a phase. Avoiding eye contact is one early sign of autism. Learn the others today. The sooner it's diagnosed, the better. Welcome back to County Wise. We've got a few minutes left of the program, but we do want to hit. We've talked defensible space. Firewise.org is a great place to go. Call your local fire department, fire district, and find out. See if they can send somebody to your house and tell you, okay, this is wrong. This needs to be dealt with. This needs to be taken back, cut down, whatever, moved. Uh, and, and, and just get ready for the wildfire season because it is here. I, I think we've established that, haven't we? Mm -hmm. yeah, Absolutely. It is definitely it here. It is here. We have two guaranteed, mm -hmm. genuine wildfires burning right now in the Coconino National Forest. Guaranteed they're small, but... They're there. Yeah, they've been labeled wildfires, and and we've seen that throughout the last month and a half now, where there's been different fires in different right. districts and stuff like that. So it's happening. Yeah. We're dry. Uh, evacuations. Uh, we had the Yarnell Hill fire last year, the Dosi fire, and it it. I, I'm even. I have to say I'm guilty of it too. You, you think to yourself, oh, it's not going to happen to me. But what if? Yeah. You need to really be prepared. If you have a, um, as we saw with Dosi, um, that started on one side of Granite Mountain and, and covered it within less than a burn period, which a lot of people didn't feel it was gonna make it all the way through mm -hmm. the granite and over like it did. Um, evacuations are primary responsibility of law enforcement with, with help from us as far as recommendation and timing. Um, mm -hmm. But basically, you need to be prepared. If you live in the urban interface, most of the people on the, on the Dosi fire didn't expect it to come down in their neighborhoods like it did. And, and uh, so you need to be thinking ahead of time on, on being prepared, especially during the wildland season, which as you mentioned, we're into now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. people should start having a, a basic plan. Um, what are some of the basics? The, ba the basics are, first of all, you need to make sure, you're, we, we call it the five Ps, people, pets, pills, um, photos, photos and, and uh, papers, important okay. papers. The five uh, insurance Ps. your papers, the five Ps. Okay. Make sure you have those readily accessible, something you can grab together. Yep. And I know everybody has their family pictures on their walls and things they want, but you should have that already pre-planned on what you're gonna grab in a very short period of time. Yep. You need to be able to evacuate. There's a lot of people that, that if the fire isn't like within vision of their home, they feel they don't need to evacuate. If you're being advised to evacuate, you need to evacuate the area. What do you do in that situation? When somebody says, ah, I don't see no fire. We can't, okay. we can't legally force somebody yeah. to leave their property. Mm -hmm. However, they do walk off their property, we will have them arrested typically because they are, there's a, if it's a mandatory evacuation, mm -hmm. they're not to leave their property. Gotcha. And so if they start wandering around the neighborhood, part of it is from a law enforcement standpoint, right. they're afraid of looting and some of that. Mm -hmm. right. From our standpoint, and, and law enforcement as well, uh, is, is the life safety aspect. Yep. Sure. And, and uh, one of the other issues that people don't realize is that reluctancy to evacuate causes us problems as we're trying to roll our apparatus mm -hmm. in and, and get in alignment and get some work done. So they start blocking our, our uh, interest routes. And, and a lot of times we try to have established uh, exit routes for them, escape routes for them, yeah. and we're coming in on another one. So if they choose a different route, they could actually be slowing down or hindering our progress. Yeah. Is there a, maybe it's a silly question, but is there a, a, a set amount of time usually when we decide an evacuation is going to take place if the fire is, say, a mile away from my home? How much time, if you, if, when you're knocking on my door, usually how much time do we have to, to get out? Probably within about 10 minutes is what we're looking for people to get, get to get on the road. And, and that's why we're saying if you're prepared, they talk, there are a lot of these websites you can go on, they talk about 72 hour kits where you should actually have a sleeping bag for everybody. You should have a, a couple of days worth of chains of clothing. You'll wind up going to an evacuation shelter. And the important thing about that that I'd like to touch in on is, is we're trying to be accountable for all of the, the residents in the area. Mm -hmm. If you may, you may have friends in, in a, a neighboring, neighboring town or an area that's not impacted by the fire, so you, and you have a choice to go with them, that obviously beats a hotel. And, and, uh, but we still need you to check in at the evacuation sites so we know, and, the, the, and those shelters, so we know that you're accounted for. Yeah. Okay. That's one of the key issues that we look for is that accountability. It's important as well. Okay, we're out of time. Central Yavapai Fire District Fire Marshal Rick Chase, Battalion Chief Gary Cordes, our guest today. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Paul. We scraped the surface, but hopefully we threw enough information right. out there to get everybody th kind of thinking about it right now. Yeah. That's today's Countywide, and we will talk to you again next time.